Welcome to the May edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. I'm Portia Young. We begin with new information concerning landlords and lead in our drinking water. On March 23rd, 1036 focused exclusively on this issue in a one-hour special. 1036 and our partners at WUWM have now uncovered a serious communication breakdown concerning what Milwaukee health officials say is a public health crisis. Mary Tolsky teaches history and government at Pius XI Catholic High School. She takes that job seriously, as well as her role as landlord. Tolsky owns two duplexes in Milwaukee's Sherman Park neighborhood. Both have lead service lines. Back in January, Tolsky bought filters for her tenants. One of the properties has a baby. I want it to be proactive. One of my concerns is I don't know if they're using them because that would be why they wouldn't need to replace them. Or are they using them and they're not aware that they need to watch to see that they wear out and need to be replaced? I, I mean, I, I don't know where the breakdown is. So I don't want to go into their apartment and say, are you using this correctly? Because that to me is, that's not my responsibility. But at the same time, I want to make sure that if I'm giving them that tool, it's like a smoke detector. It's connected correctly and it's going to work. She happened to watch the 1036 special and says it heightened her concern. Was she doing enough by simply giving her tenants filters? Was she fulfilling her legal responsibilities as a landlord? I just am looking for the fairest and most affordable solution that's gonna actually fix it. You know, and, and on a really simple level, if I'm the landlord paying the water bill and I'm getting this, my tenants aren't even getting that information. So if they're not paying attention in some other way, I might be their only source for that information, and that's not good either. Last month in April, Tulski spotted lead information folded into her water bill and started making phone calls. She decided to start with neighborhood services. A woman gave Tulski two numbers, including the Milwaukee Health Department's lead resource line, 225-LED. That number led nowhere. 414-225-5323. The number you have reached has been disconnected or is, is no longer possible? in service. 225-5323. She even double-checked that number on the health department's website. I don't know. That's weird. Finally, Tulski made human contact with Milwaukee Waterworks. So is there any recommendation right now from Waterworks or the city about what the best thing to do is as a landlord? Basically, they're saying you can um, either purchase a water filtration pitcher or a water filtering system to attach to your faucet. Okay. Um, okay. Is there any additional recommendations? You're, you're saying the lead line lateral replacement would be an option? Yes. If her pipe cracked or ruptured, or the adjoining main line needed work, Tulski would qualify for Milwaukee's cost share program and would pay no more than $1,600. Otherwise, Tulski was told she could be proactive and replace her line, but it might cost her as much as $3,000. 3000 3, did you say? Yes. To replace the, the whole line? Yes. Okay. And the city would not help with that at all? Uh, only for the... Well, they do have a option if you don't have any leaks in your service, they would um, replace it and put it on your property taxes at a cost to you over a 10-year period. That information is not correct. According to the city ordinance, residents only qualify for the 10-year payment plan if the lateral breaks or the water main needs repair. Because she didn't get clear answers, Tosky contacted her alderman, Michael Murphy, about her frustrations. Murphy emailed her back promptly, saying, quote, I will discuss this with a few department heads to figure out improvements in the process. In addition, Murphy's aide left Tosky a voicemail apologizing for the disconnected phone number. They are going to update the website. The health department just never got around to changing the number, unfortunately. The city also hasn't gotten around to creating a comprehensive plan for landlords regarding lead and water. 1036 stopped in at a six-hour landlord training session provided by the Department of Neighborhood Services earlier this month. The instructor briefly mentioned the service line issue. You'll also notice we have some lead piping uh, brochures from the city of Milwaukee. Please feel free. We have that same information on the city website. We asked Operations Director Tom Mischewski what his advice to landlord Mary Tolsky would be. 
start simple by having the water tested to see if there is a, a, a contamination or a problem. And again, the Milwaukee Health Department can assist with uh, recommendations of where to have the water tested. Mischewski says educating landlords on the dangers of lead paint has been central to the program for years. The hazards to lead service uh, lines uh, are not as great as the hazards from potential hazards from lead paint. But of course, any exposure, whether it's from water or from paint, can be, you know, any be amount of lead is too much lead. Correct. So it's really as of this workshop on May 3rd, 2017, that the um, lead lateral information will be, is becoming a part of the curriculum. Yes, we are adding that to our landlord training curriculum. Last September, the Common Council created a task force to come up with how best to handle Milwaukee's daunting lead pipe crisis. I feel like I know the system should work a little bit better than it seems to be working at the moment. I mean, you still can't get the specific answers that are helpful. That just seems pretty ineffective. A little frustrating. So, Susan Bentz from WUWM joins us now. Okay, Susan, let's start with the phone issue. What did the city say? A spokesperson told me that two months into that program, they needed to change the number because they had used a 225 number and the city's numbers are all 286 and so they needed to adjust that. It was a technical issue. Okay, so they needed 286, not yeah. 225. Yes. Okay. Well, let's go back to the landlord. Are there any legal implications there? There are none. Um, the landlord does not need to notify their tenant that they have a lead lateral. They don't have to provide a filter. Right now there are no rules, there are no laws around that. All right, Susan Bentz, thank you so much for following this story for us here on 1036. You can always check out milwaukeepbs.org to hear more about lead and our health. Homesteading something many of us have probably thought about. Leaving hectic city life for quiet rural Wisconsin to grow and consume our own food. But the love of the land doesn't come without hard work and challenges, as we find out from a popular outdoorsman and his wife. I've lived many places in my life and quite a number of lifestyles too. But here, I found a place where I belong. The land itself embraces me. It's a relationship with a place that I've never experienced before. Hey guys, look at I grew up on a farm. I love living with animals and out in the country. I began to really want to have our own land and to grow a lot more of our own food and to have animals as well. And then the global food, energy, economic situation not looking so good. I said, you know what, it's really time. If we're going to do this, we need to do it. Um, my husband didn't grow up on a farm. It took a little convincing and we had a, quite a few conversations about the benefits of having our own food in our own place. And after some nudging, he agreed. Hi there. I happen to be that husband. Perhaps you recognize me. I'm Dan Small, host of Outdoor Wisconsin. We had a pretty good thunderstorm last night. I want to check the rain gauge, and there's a lot to do on the farm, so time to get going. <laughs> They're hungry, I can hear them. Come and get it. In the beginning, it was more of a, he did that and I did this kind of thing. <laughs> but he has become fond of some of the animals and now he'll come back. I remember him coming in with it and saying, oh, I got this many eggs and look at this and look at that. And I'm going, okay, you're starting to really like this now. They went through a fair amount of water last night and this morning. We've worked out uh, an understanding of who's going to do what, and when I'm home, uh, I do most of the cooking. And then Shivani is free to get the gardens going. I'm breeding new varieties of winter squash. I plant a whole bunch of different seeds that I saved from the year before, and when I do the pollinations, each plant gets this. So when you do the pollination, it has to be done by hand. 
I think I'm going to call this Silver Queen. Of course, I take care of the sheep. All right, let's go. We share the work, and I think our relationship is now stronger than it was 10 years ago, and maybe stronger than when we started. This is our attached greenhouse. We're not farmers, we're homesteaders, so to speak. Farmers are making a living at it, or hoping to. Homesteaders are more about um, trying to be as self-sustaining and self-productive as possible. Uh, nobody's entirely so, but when we eat a meal where almost everything on the plate came from here, it's a really, and then we'll go, oh, geez, what didn't come from here? Oh, the salt and the olive oil, and yeah, that's a nice feeling. Our whole operation really is about food production, and the job of the sheep is to turn grass into meat and wool, and the job of the goats is to turn grass and hay into milk and cheese, and the chickens, of course, produce eggs and produce meat. And of course the gardens uh, feed us as well. We aim to live as sustainably as possible. I never thought about this until a few months ago, but uh, we eat meat twice a day and I have not bought meat in two years. So from the sheep, the chickens, and an occasional deer and turkey, you know, we feed ourselves. This is only a 10 acre property here, and we do most everything by hand, so, and there's only two of us with occasional help. Uh, so it's very labor intensive. Farming or homesteading is a full-time job, basically. It requires a commitment to be there all the time, to do what needs to be done, and uh, make sure the animals are cared for. We're into our fourth year now. 20 sheep, Liliana and Luna, 14 goats, 40 chickens, vegetable gardens, you want to taste? <laughs> it's good. We both grew up in western New York. I'm from the Buffalo area and Shivani's from the Hornell area, which is south of Rochester. We grew up about 90 miles apart. We met in a summer program between junior and senior years of high school. And after a couple of years of being Sweethearts, we went our separate ways and uh, found each other again many years later. We lived in Ozaki County for just about 25 years. It was near Milwaukee and it was easy for me to get to Channel 10 and to other places where my work required me to be, but there were drawbacks there as well. So we moved. <laughs> we ended up in the Driftless area for a number of reasons. It's beautiful to begin with. It's absolutely gorgeous over here. And there's a lot of people who live more the way we're living now. A lot of organic farming, back to the lander type people living very simply to whom um, money's not the most important thing the way the quality of life is the most important thing. Well, come on out. I honestly didn't know what I was getting into yeah, yeah. with the farm or homestead. I mean, it's a small operation, but it's a lot of work. So now I gotta move a couple of calf huts. And this is fun. I just get inside and put them on my back. They weigh about 65 pounds. And we just get it balanced and pick it up and then we just play turtle. My cardiologist says just come in once a year. <laughs> we really should have started this probably 25 or 30 years ago. Um, I'm in better shape though now than I was 10 years ago before we started this because I'm doing something physical every day. And hard work has got a bad rap. Um, what's wrong with hard work? It's really a very early morning to late afternoon, almost dawn to dusk operation. I'm tired by the end of the day. <sighs> it's hot today. Winter for farmers and homesteaders, I think winter is not a season, it's an occupation. I don't know who said that, but I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it gets very cold here. Uh, sometimes minus 25. And I was having a very hard time, so I have to milk anyway, you know. Um, good thing the goats are nice and hot. They're like little hand warmers. 
most people do something day after day. If you work in an office, you go there day after day, but you go, ah, ah, oh, it's Monday. Oh, thank God, it's Friday. Here, like, every day of the week is the same to me. And I don't find it a burden to do this work because I, I really enjoy feeding the animals. You know? Always I'm petting the animal, the goats. After they get milk, they get a little massage. They're very friendly. <laughs> hey, girls. You want some? What uh... motivates me is um, just knowing that the animals need help, need us to feed them. Oh, you're going to come out and say hello? It's like having kids. Come on. They can't take care of themselves. Knowing that those animals need you, and so you get up and do it. Most of the time things go smoothly here, but sometimes things don't go smoothly. Mimsy's still learning to be a sheep, and uh, once in a while she gets out and she runs around because it's just too much fun to be outside, and then we try to catch her. Come on. You got her, you got her, okay. All right, well, now we're going back in the pen. Okay, Mimsy, you're back in for now. I named Mimsy, and I was thinking of that um, Lewis Carroll poem, The Jabberwocky, and Say all it. mimsy were the... Hmm? Say it. All mimsy were the borrow groves and the mome rats outgrabed. That's the line, yeah. Yeah, that's the line, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, Mimsy, there's the name for a sheep. So, Mimsy, got your bottle. Yep. The mother was too weak to feed her, couldn't make enough milk, didn't want to feed her. Um, and so she's a bottle baby. I would feel really, really bad for the to little Mimsy. You know, she's a keeper. It's an interesting thing about raising animals that you take the best care of them as you can. You spend time with them. Some of them you become very fond of, attached to even. And, but some of them are destined to be supper. We call him Badger because he's got a badger looking face there. One of the hardest things for me is actually having to slaughter an animal that I've given a name and that I've cared for and I've come to know as uh, a creature with a personality. He's gonna die in two weeks, this guy. He's done, he doesn't know it. I don't know if I wanna say that here, but. And I, I don't wanna do it, you know, he's my buddy. One of the first sheep that I slaughtered and butchered here was our ram from several years ago, Edgar. He was really friendly. He was almost like a puppy. He'd follow me around and love treats. And uh, when I killed him and skinned him, I, I had a friend over to help me with it because I wasn't sure I could do it. But I said, no, I'm gonna do it because you know it's part of the deal. And I got through the meat cutting process and we had him in, you know, all cut up and in the freezer. and. Uh, sat down to our first meal and I actually burst into tears because the uh, emotional attachment to this animal had, I'd been repressing it. And uh, once I got over that, I was able to enjoy that uh, loin, roast loin of lamb and there's nothing tastier, really. It doesn't make it any easier. I've been a hunter all my life and so I've butchered pheasants and uh, grouse and deer and a chicken is just a big pheasant and the sheep is just a deer with uh, little different dimensions. All the cuts are the same. So I'm butchering, uh, cutting up, skinning. It's, it, you know, you learn how to do it. I thought as I neared retirement, I'd uh, kick back and do a lot more fishing and hunting and just plain relaxing, but I'm doing less of those things now, but actually getting different rewards. Come on guys, I got some minerals for you. Can't pet a deer, but Badger here will let me rub his ears and rub his chin. And... Honey, you wanna keep an eye on the hazel? Very long term, what we've thought about is uh, bringing in younger people who would then inherit the place, who would, we'd make a place for them to live and care for us if we need it. We hope we're just gonna go boom like that, but you never know. Um, and, because neither of our kids are interested, they both live in New York City. Hard enough to do it yourself. There are times when the work is really hard and uh, it, it's easy to say, man, 
this is more than I can handle. But those moments are rare. I really like being here, and sometimes I just choke up at the beauty of the place and the, the animals, and we're, we're happy here. Here's another story about relationships and sharing passions. 1036's Dan Jones brings us the story of art and marriage and how the two go hand in hand for one very talented couple. The small village of Stoddard, Wisconsin sits on the beautiful banks of the Mississippi River not far from the city of La Crosse. Just a few feet from the railroad tracks sits a small house where creativity lives. Can I turn it on? Andy Fletcher paints pastoral scenes, oil on canvas, beautiful landscapes, Americana, Wisconsin, a simpler time. I think I paint things that represent good things about our country in my mind, craft, beauty. I think I try to paint things that represent an older, more sustainable way of farming. I try to paint things that aren't so obvious. I don't try to paint things that are just completely just done just because it's pretty trees or just because it's pretty. I want there to be an edge to it or a sense of realism. I think that's when I did a good job was when people emotionally respond to what I do. When I'm at a show or something and somebody walks by and they're not really even paying attention and I see that it just hits them, that they just walk by, that they saw this thing, they stopped what they were doing and just had to look at it. It was powerful or good enough or different enough or whatever that they just stopped and had to look at it. And sometimes they buy it even, but not that that matters. It's just that the, it was an emotional, pure emotional reaction to what, what I was looking at. Just a few blocks away from home, in a small studio space, you'll find Katie Musa, watercolors, plants, animals, flora, and fauna. I found this one stuck in the door here at the studio. Bugs and birds, things she finds on walks through the neighborhood and along the highway. I do the kind of art that I do right now is in a, it's a direct response to the place that I live. Living in a place like like Stoddard, where you're right on the river, you know, right in the midst of um, lots of migration and, and, and lots of wildlife and um, it, just responding to it, you know, that's, that's the most, most abundant around here. And um, it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> I find I have uh, a real direct relationship to it. Um, there's, there's this real, real, real basic curiosity um, to these kind of things because when I first moved here, I wasn't really regularly knowledgeable about, about these things I was finding, um, the plants, the mushrooms, the, the random feathers, and, um, and I really, really wanted to be closer to it and know more about it. And um, there was just kind of this uh, mystery of, of coming from the city and moving here and um, finding these beautiful things that uh, that I didn't know, you know, I didn't know the stories behind them. Katie used to paint portraits of people, only people. A few years ago, she was the well-known artist-in-residence at Milwaukee's historic and luxurious Pfister Hotel, where her work still hangs. She was very good at it and loved it, but she hasn't painted a portrait in years. I can see it definitely swinging back to that, but only in a way where it would be just for me. You know, as opposed to this stuff, I know I'm making a living on this. If I were to sit down and paint a person now, it would be just because I want to, just because I want to prove to how, how good I could do it, just to see how far I could push it. I don't care what that person thinks. I wouldn't ever care about selling it. And that seems like a really pure, exciting thing. So um, I can see 
I can see how going back and forth between those two um, is really beneficial because this kind of painting has made me a better painter technique wise and observation and challenge and watercolor is difficult you know and all my other paintings of people were in um, oil and acrylic and so I can see how these those two ways of working actually would blend into each other and enrich each other really really well. Andy and Katie are husband and wife, born, raised, educated, and trained in the Milwaukee area. But this is home now. It is where they feel most alive. The Mississippi River is their front yard. You live on this beautiful Mississippi River. How much does this influence your art? You're so far away from the big city. If I feel connected to all the music that came out of this country on the river, and I feel connected to the like the lifeblood of our country and our identity. And I think that's what my paintings are about. But for my work, I mean, this is this is the playground. This is where all the, the stories start, you know, is, is right out here in the marsh, in the water, around, on the ground. So it's, it's, the, it's the beginning of everything. A couple of years ago, Andy and Katie were married at this church in Milwaukee. Instead of accepting an honorarium, the pastor told them about an idea for a painting that he had carried in his head for nearly 30 years. The moment, the very moment, after the flood when Noah opens the door of the ark and sees the wonder and possibility of the new day that lies ahead. Andy and Katie delivered, and the painting is now the first thing you see when you walk in the church. It is more than I think I, think I, I imagined. Uh, they put a lot of um, detail into the painting. The more you look at it, the more animals you keep finding, the more touches you find. Uh, but certainly the, the faces, which is all I wanted, uh, they certainly did that and, and more. You were telling me when you're at art fairs, you watch people all the time, look at your stuff, mm -hmm. and you can tell that they have an emotional connection mm -hmm. and a reaction to your work. When you look at this painting, do you have an emotional connection to it? I think of getting married here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is all part of the package of getting married here and our relationship with um, Pastor Mark and, uh, and the church. And the church and, and the story. I mean, there's, it's a lot of great things wrapped up in one piece and the emotion of him and I doing a piece together, you know, for the first time. Um, thank God it was after the marriage, you know. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> we did pretty well. <laughs> Whether it's flora or fauna, faces or places, it is all natural, it is all real. What we get to look at is a deep and very personal connection between the artist and what they see and what they feel. And maybe, just maybe, we will feel the same thing. Andy and Katie will both be at Milwaukee's Lakefront Festival of Art next month. Thank you for joining us for this edition of 1036. We're back on June 16th. Remember, check us out at milwaukeepbs.org. We leave you with some spring beauty in Wauwatosa from above. <laughs>